Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to this special STS AATS webinar, Coronary Revascularization Guideline, Why STS and AATS Did Not Endorse. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the STS website and STS YouTube channel. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce STS President, Dr. John Calhoun, and AATS President, Dr. Shaf Kishavji. Dr. Calhoun, welcome, and let me turn it over to you. Good evening, I'm John Calhoun, President of the STS, and welcome to this webinar. We're happy to be joined by our colleagues from the AATS to address the recent published guidelines of the AHA, ACC, and SKY on coronary vascularization, which our societies chose not to endorse. As such, in many ways, it's difficult, difficult to regard them as anything more than recommendations. I want to stress that we see great benefit to this time of disagreement. It's brought our specialty together in a wonderful manner. We've enjoyed some terrific collaboration with the AHS as we've worked to address this contentious concern. We're also grateful to the surgeons who strived in development of these guidelines to get them right and to make them better, although we didn't agree with them from a societal standpoint. Finally, I'd like to highlight the great support of our cardiac surgical colleagues around the globe to this cause. Our partners at EACS, the Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Latin American cardiac surgical societies all over the world have voiced very similar concerns to ours. I'd like to welcome the president of AHS, Dr. Shaf Kashavji, to say a few words before he introduces our panel. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Thank you, John. The AATS has received similar communications from many cardiothoracic surgeons and officially from their societies around the globe. As most of you know, even though I'm a thoracic surgeon, there is no question in my mind or that of the AATS and STS cardiac surgical leaders that several key recommendations within this AHA ACC document were just not endorsable. To take our viewers back, we did have the opportunity to make suggestions to improve this document ahead of time, but our most important concerns were not addressed by the process. As a result, and with thoughtful consideration of the ramifications, the AATS and the STS chose not to endorse this document. With this in mind, it is important to note that our patients deserve a better process than what has been in place. The best evidence-based guidelines come from a process where the number of experts on each side of an issue are balanced and each society or discipline selects a team of knowledgeable experts. Similarly, the process benefits from clear and better definitions of what constitutes bias, how many experts are required, which ones can vote, and what actually constitutes a clinical guideline. Such standards do exist and have been clearly published by important sources such as the Institute of Medicine. With those basic tenets in mind, it is my pleasure to introduce our webinar leader, Dr. Joe Savick, who led our joint editorial response with key content experts from both the AATS and the STS to provide a clear in-depth overview of our concerns, the process which got us here and our responses to date. After these experts are finished, our webinar team would be happy to answer your questions. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Kasavji. I would also like to welcome you to tonight's webinar titled Coronary Revascularization Guidelines, Why the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and American Association for Thoracic Surgery did not endorse. As you are well aware, the American College of Cardiology American Heart Association, and Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions recently released guidelines on coronary artery revascularization. Although the American Association for Thoracic Surgery and Society of Thoracic Surgeons had representatives on this guideline writing committee, our two societies ultimately decided not to endorse the guidelines because the guidelines do not reflect our interpretation of the best treatment for patients with ischemic heart disease. Our lack of endorsement has been met by resounding support 
from the international cardiothoracic surgery community. Today, we will discuss the reasons our surgical societies and international cardiothoracic surgical community have decided not to support these guidelines. I would like to introduce our panel of experts who will detail our surgical society's reasoning. Dr. Thomas McGilvery, first vice president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and chief of cardiac surgery and thoracic transplant at Houston Methodist Hospital. Dr. Leonard Draudi, member of the board of directors of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery and the O. Wayne Isom professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery at New York Presbyterian Whale Cornell Medical College. And Dr. Lars Svensson, vice president of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery and chairman of the Seidel and Arnold Miller Family Heart, Vascular and Thoracic Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you panelists for participating in tonight's discussion. I also would like to encourage all our attendees to place questions and discussion points in the chat box and question and answer box. After our panelists discussion, we will answer as many of your questions as time allows. Dr. McGilvery, maybe we can start with you. As you know, the Surgical Society's main objection to the revascularization guidelines is the decrease in the class of recommendation from one to two B for coronary artery bypass grafting to improve survival compared to medical therapy in patients with three vessel coronary artery disease and normal left ventricular function. A class one recommendation is a strong recommendation and strongly supports the therapy. In other words, the benefits of the therapy to patients greatly outweighs the risk of the procedure. A class 2B recommendation, however, is a weak recommendation and suggests that the benefit of the therapy may be better or just equal to the risk of the therapy. Tom, why do the societies not agree with this downgrade? Thank you, Dr. Savick, and I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to discuss our concerns. Uh, as you mentioned, Joe, that in the recent guidelines, cabbage for these patients, that is three vessel disease with normal left ventricular function, is now a class 2B recommendation. And as you said, that's a weak recommendation. This represents a downgrade from the previous class 1 strong recommendation, which was published in the 2011 cabbage guidelines from the same group. The guideline committee stated that this downgrade reflected new evidence showing that there was no advantage of cabbage over medical therapy alone to improve survival in these patients, that is three vessel disease with preserved left ventricular function in those patients who didn't have left main stenosis. Well, so what is this new evidence that warranted the change? The new evidence is largely based on the International Study of Comparative Health Effectiveness with Medical and Invasive Approaches, better known as the ischemia trial. The ischemia trial, which was reported in 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at patients with stable coronary artery disease who were identified as having moderate or severe ischemia by stress testing. In this trial, approximately 5,000 patients were randomized to two groups. One group was the initial conservative strategy. That is, these patients didn't have coronary angiograms and they were treated with optimal medical therapy. The second cohort, the, inv the initial invasive strategy, in this group, the patients had a coronary angiogram and often, but not always, uh, were treated with revascularization, either by PCI or by cabbage if they, if they were indicated. The conclusion of the trial uh, stated that there was no evidence that the initial invasive strategy compared with the initial conservative strategy reduced the risk of ischemic cardiovascular events or death over a median of 3.2 years. 
That certainly is an impressive soundbite, implying that there was no difference between medical therapy and cabbage. But as we all know, the devil's in the details. Cardiovascular mortality in both groups were low, about 6% at five years. That's probably or perhaps related to the fact that enrolling clinicians were supposed to have equipoise between revascularization and medical therapy alone. Many of the patients enrolled in the ischemia trial were not. They were not representative of multivessel coronary artery disease patients. That would be based on evidence-based guidelines directed to a heart team to have a recommendation for cabbage. Again, I repeat, at randomization, these patients did not have a coronary angiogram yet. So it needs to be stated that the ischemia trial was not designed nor was it powered uh, to determine whether cabbage improved survival compared to medical therapy alone. The cabbage patients in this study represented 26% of all revascularizations in the trial. Not 26% of the patients, 26% of the patients that had revascularization. That means that 84% of those revascularized had PCI. Uh, Cabbage was performed in only 20% of the patients that were randomized into the initial invasive strategy group. It's really amazing that there were more patients in the invasive strategy group who received optimal medical therapy alone than the number of patients in that group who received a cabbage. Furthermore, there were more patients in the conservative strategy group who received revascularization than there were patients in the invasive strategy group who received a cabbage. So as you can see, there was considerable crossover that was confounding between these two groups. Less than half of the patients who did have angiograms had significant proximal left anterior descending artery stenosis. For the patients who did get revascularization, it would seem that between uh, they, who did get revascularization, the decision between cabbage and PCI was left up to the heart team. It seems like cabbage was underutilized based on best medical evidence, given that 42% of these patients had diabetes and over 71% of these patients had multivessel disease. Nevertheless, as it was counted from a revascularization perspective, cabbage and PCI were considered to be the same during the analysis, and, and we do not think this is appropriate, and I think Dr. Girardi will speak to that a little bit later. The mean follow-up of the ischemia trial was 3.2 years, and we do know from other studies that that is too short of a time period to re realize a significant survival benefit from cabbage. Although the ischemia trial did have some interesting observation, it clearly was not a study that robustly compared cabbage to medical therapy alone for patients with three vessel disease in normal left ventricular function. So in addition to that new evidence for medical therapy uh, boosted by the ischemia trial, the, uh, the authors also devalued older evidence that supported cabbage. That includes multiple registry-based studies, large meta-analyses, randomized controlled trials, including the VA coronary artery bypass study, the European cooperative study, and the CAS trial, uh, that all of those showed significant survival benefit of cabbage over medical therapy in this patient population. The guideline committee discounted these data because according to them, they thought these studies were too old that they were completed more than 20 years ago. I would think that would be like suggesting that the evidence linking cigarette smoking and lung cancer based on studies from the 1970s are no longer valid because no new data has been released to corroborate those important findings. The authors further devalued these landmark studies supporting cabbage because it was, and I quote, before antiplatelet and statin therapies and before broad recommendations for beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. To add insult to injury, I think this statement does not take into consideration 
the advances that have been made in coronary artery surgery, including multi-arterial grafting, improved myocardial protection strategies, advances in anesthesia and invasive care management, and guideline-directed medical therapy after cabbage. The guideline committee also disregarded some more recent prospective randomized control trials demonstrating the survival benefit of cabbage uh, shown in the Syntax trial, Excel, Noble, uh, as well as a large meta-analysis from Youssef and colleagues of more than several randomized uh, studies that demonstrated the cabbage prolonged survival more than medical therapy in patients with three vessel coronary artery disease without left main disease. And of the last trial is the MASS-2 trial, which was probably the most robust, if there is such a thing, uh, of the healthiest of the cabbage patients that randomized cabbage, medical therapy, and PCI. In over a 10-year period, cabbage was superior with regard to cardiac survival than either medical therapy or PCI. All of these data I mentioned above are included in the European ESC and EX uh, 2018 as class one recommendations supporting cabbage for patients with three vessel disease and normal left ventricular function. So in summary, Joe, we believe that the downgrade of the previous strong level one recommendation to a weak to be recommendation for cabbage for patients with three vessel coronary disease and preserve left ventricular function to improve survival over medical therapy alone is not in keeping with the best medical evidence and it does a disservice to our patients with multivessel coronary disease and the physicians who care for them. Thanks very much, Joe, for the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you, Tom. Those were terrific points and a wonderful discussion. Dr. Girardi, maybe you can discuss the second reason our societies decided not to endorse these guidelines. And Tom has hinted to this already. You know, in these guidelines, Percutaneous coronary intervention and coronary artery bypass grafting are grouped together as equivalent revascularization strategies in decreasing late ischemic events. Len, why do the societies believe it's not in our patient's best interest to group these two revascularization techniques together in valuing late ischemic outcomes? Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Savick, and great presentation, Dr. McGilvery. I'd also like to, to thank the Executive Committee of both the Society of Thoracic Surgery and the American Association for Thoracic Surgery for their unwavering support as we've gone through the process of vetting these recommendations. So the AATS and STS were also concerned with the recommendations made by the writing group regarding best revascularization strategies for patients with significant complex coronary artery disease. Specifically, when examining the recommendations in section 8.1 of the guidelines document, it is difficult to reconcile the data with the 2A recommendation that, quote, it is reasonable to consider cabbage over PCI in patients with complex or diffuse coronary disease and high syntax scores, those of greater than or equal to 33. The subsequent synopsis and recommendation-specific supportive text recognize that PCI and cabbage are inherently different in the mechanisms by which they improve blood flow to jeopardize myocardium. It is acknowledged that while PCI relieves discrete obstructions and increases luminal diameter, it has no effect on plaque progression or plaque rupture in other disease segments of a treated artery. Cabbage, on the other hand, not only improves flow to the myocardium subtended by the diseased artery, but also protects the distal myocardial beds from future ischemic insults generated by proximal plaque rupture or disease progression. Furthermore, this section of the supportive text goes on to highlight the 10-year follow-up results of the syntax trial, a prospective randomized trial comparing PCI to cabbage in 1,800 patients. The 10-year follow-up of this important trial presented data on 93% of the PCI patients and 95% of the cabbage patients enrolled into this critical trial and then followed for a median time of 11.2 years, an extraordinary accomplishment. 
That seminal paper was published in The Lancet in 2019, and the data was appropriately referenced in this section. That 10-year follow-up of syntax demonstrated a 40% higher mortality rate with PCI in the group of patients with triple vessel disease. Hmm. This survival benefit was particularly pronounced in those patients with high syntax scores. Again, those with a syntax score of greater than or equal to 33. It was disappointing to see that the authors ended this section of the recommendation specific supportive text with the following comment. And I quote, of note, the syntax trial included patients with first generation drug eluting stents and significant progress has been made in stent design since this trial, end quote, and end of that section. There was no mention of the improvements also made in the performance of coronary bypass grafting during the same interval. For instance, in the recent New England Journal of Medicine publication of the results of the FAME-3 trial, the operative mortality for 743 patients randomized to cabbage was 0.3%. Nonetheless, despite highlighting the aforementioned benefits of cabbage over PCI, a 2A recommendation was issued. This was particularly troubling given that there were a number of subsequent randomized trials, meta-analyses, and patient-level analyses Reference within this supported text of Section 8.1 that also lends support to the results of syntax. Negating the concerns that a randomized trial using first generation drug eluting stents biased those results in favor of cabbage was a more recent New England Journal of Medicine publication by Park et al., in which 880 patients were randomized to cabbage or to PCI with the second generation Averolimus eluting stent, the so called BEST trial. At median follow-up of 4.6 years, the primary endpoint of a composite of death, myocardial infarction, or target vessel revascularization occurred in a significantly greater percentage of patients after PCI, despite the use of this newer technology. The rate of repeat revascularization, defined as any revascularization, including target vessel revascularization, was double for those patients undergoing PCI. In addition, the rate of spontaneous myocardial infarction was also significantly higher after PCI among those undergoing cabbage, and this difference was sustained even when performing a landmark analysis that included events that occurred more than 30 days after randomization. Finally, it is noteworthy that the aforementioned recent New England Journal of Medicine publication of those results of FAME 3 took it a step further. In that randomized controlled trial, 1,500 patients underwent either FFR-guided PCI with a current generation Zeterolimus eluting stent or bypass surgery. In patients with three-vessel disease and a mean syntax score of 26, cabbage resulted in a lower incidence of the composite endpoint of death, myocardial infarction, stroke, or repeat revascularization, even at the limited follow-up time of one year. And this was despite a dramatic improvement in PCI-related mortality and repeat revascularization when comparing the results of FFR-guided PCI in FAME 3 to those previously ported with a first-generation drug-eluting statin syntax. FAME 3 was also notable for shedding light on the importance of medical therapy after surgery for patients undergoing cabbage. The use of postoperative statins and beta blockers in FAME was far superior to their use in patients enrolled in syntax. And this too may have contributed to the superior results seen with bypass surgery, despite comparisons to the latest greatest stent technology. Given the limits of time, I will not highlight the numerous additional studies referenced within section 8.1, demonstrating not only a survival advantage for cabbage over PCI for those with complex coronary artery disease, but also a reduction in repeat revascularization and myocardial infarction. It seems the evidence was overwhelmingly in favor of cabbage over PCI for this select group of patients, and a class one recommendation seems warranted. It is difficult to discern how the data is presented with these, within these new recommendations led to such lukewarm support for modern bypass surgery. I thank you all for your attention and return it to Dr. Sabit for his comments. Thank you, Len, for that excellent discussion and very, very nice summary. Dr. Svensson, a third area of concern, the American Association for Thoracic Surgery and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons relates to the class of recommendation one, 
for radial artery grafting in coronary artery bypass surgery. Our societies have supported arterial grafting. Why are they concerned with giving radial artery grafting a class of recommendation one? Thank you, Dr. Sabek, and I'd like to add to the earlier comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Calhoun and Dr. Keshavi for your opening comments and uh, the reflection of the two societies. I think Dr. McGillery did a wonderful job of uh, summarizing the reasons that we objected to the downgrading of coronary artery bypass surgery. And Dr. Girardi stressed the FAME 3 and the FFR study, uh, which was somewhat uh, out at the time of the publication of the guidelines and could have resulted in some uh, recommended changes. When it came to the issue of radial artery, I think we as cardiac surgeons and the societies were surprised to find that radial artery was rated at a higher level in table 12.2 for coronary artery bypass surgery than even the internal mammary artery and particularly the left internal mammary or internal thoracic artery. And whether the double mammary should have been included in that, that is open to debate. Certainly there is a prospect of randomized trial led by some very senior people on double mammaries, but we know from registry data that the benefits of double mammaries are only visible essentially 15 years after surgery. Uh, and that includes from the Cleveland Clinic large studies. So when it came to the use of the radial artery, the experience in the United States does not quite mirror that of the publication that was quoted uh, in the guidelines. There were three publications that were quoted. And in particular, the meta-analysis from the New England Journal of Medicine revolved around three studies not done in the United States, done by people who would be considered experts in the field of using radial arteries. And this was referenced as one of the strongest reasons for the use of radial arteries. In the United States, we at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and in particular, one of our cardiologists, Dr. Cott, have published a lower patency rate with radial arteries. And there is also the large Veterans Administration uh, paper, which will be reported at, at the double ATS uh, this year, which is a prospect of randomized trial with long-term follow-up. And we look forward to seeing the results of that. One of the issues with radial artery, it certainly is a artery that's easy to work with. Um, and it may have, in one sense, lower early complication rates in relation to the concern about mediastinitis with use of double mammary arteries. But certainly the advocates of double mammary artery have published very good results, particularly with skeletonization of the right and left internal arteries, showing less morbidity and complications with a potential long-term benefit. And somewhat it is related to what surgeons are comfortable with. The concern is that the radial artery use advocation may result in long-term poorer results. In addition, with the one paper that is quoted is Mark Moon's paper showing a 9% uh, complication rate uh, with radial artery harvesting, and 1% of those were serious complications. So it is not a noxious procedure. One of the issues is also the so-called string sign, which was often referred to the early days of internal mammary artery bypassing, but also seen with radial arteries where the radial artery shrinks up uh, fairly quickly after time. So in summary, we felt that it was a substantial jump in faith in believing that the radial artery should be listed higher than internal thoracic artery, particularly one and maybe even two. While we all as surgeons understand the value of the internal mammary artery, and that is the one technical metric that is used for STS scoring, and ideally it should be 
we do not feel that the radial artery should have risen to the level that it is at, particularly without supporting long-term follow-up. You know, thank you, Lars, for that excellent uh, discussion. Now, maybe I could ask the panelists some questions, and if it's okay with everyone, I, I'd like to start with Dr. McGilvery. You know, Tom, you know, in the guidelines, it's really very unusual to see a drop, particularly a two-level drop. And, and when these guidelines downgraded the, you know, cabbage in multivessel disease, it went from a class of recommendation one to a class of recommendation of 2B, which is really a big fall. Tom, what should the recommendation have been? Well, thank you, Joe. Yes, I mean, with, with that kind of a devaluation or downgrade, I would have thought that there should have been some dramatic data to demonstrate either that medical therapy had significantly improved or that the data that we had uh, for cabbage uh, was not what we had thought it was over the last 40 or 50 years. I mean, you, you, you could make an argument that if it were not going to keep its uh, level one recommendation, it could be a 2A recommendation. But, but I, I think as uh, we mentioned with the data that we presented, I, I think it should have remained a one, a class one recommendation, a strong recommendation. Joe, could I comment on that too? Of course. You know, I, I think Tom's points are spot on, but in, in his presentation, he also mentioned, you know, the, the support for, for cabbage in that setting had come from earlier trials, and that is true. Um, but when you look at the patient cohort for PCI and cabbage and syntax, it was exactly that group that Tom's just describing. And, and yet there was, for those patients with triple vessel disease, a 40% reduction in mortality. And that's a pretty up-to-date trial, pretty robust with five-year, 10-year follow-up, and the results hold up. And the more complex the patients get, the better cabbage looks. And it was just disappointing that that rec wasn't recognized. And it was fairly robust data in a fairly contemporary time period. So I found that disappointing. And also, Joe, I think that, uh, you know, in addition to the issue about survival, I mean, quality of life, uh, improvement in, uh, in symptoms, uh, freedom from, uh, from my, you know, from a reduced freedom from a myocardial infarction, need for reintervention, all of those I think can and should be added to it. Uh, I know those are separate uh, recommendations, but I think the whole package of cabbage for those patients really speaks for itself. Well, I think you bring up an, an excellent point, Tom. And I was actually going to direct this question to Len. You know, Len did a beautiful job, you know, really demonstrating the incredible survival benefit. And I think you have to be overwhelmed by fame. When today heart surgeons are doing heart surgery, you know, coronary surgery with a 30-day mortality of 0.3% and a one-year mortality of 0.9%. How far have we come? It's amazing. But I think you bring up an excellent point, which is when we look at all of these studies, you know, whether you want to look at Excel or whether you want to look at Noble, which are the most recent studies, which show definitely a freedom, a, a lower rate of late myocardial infarction, a much lower rate of, of reintervention. You know, Excel demonstrated improved survival at five years in patients who had coronary surgery. There was no difference in survival, as you know, in Noble. But again, I think the one thing we all need to remember is that these patients in these randomized trials are very select patients. As you know, we took out that high risk population of patients, patients with left main and triple vessel disease for the most part, which make up somewhere between 50 and two thirds of the patients with left main disease. But even in these patients with non-complex disease, we are seeing lower myocardial infarctions, lower repeat reinterventions, and, and as Len very nicely demonstrated, better survival. Len, how should the guideline committee have handled this? Should they have given a lot more credit to surgery 
I have to admit, that's what surprised me. Well, thanks, Joe. I, I, I think for sure, um, one thing that I would would push for in the future is 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 a little bit more time to review the data as presented. And then once we have a chance to review the data, instead of it being a confirmation, it should be a discussion. And we didn't have that opportunity and that was very disappointing. Uh, the, the, the evidence supporting bypass surgery, in my personal opinion, is so overwhelming for certain high risk populations, high burden, complex disease, high syntax scores, is so, is so supportive of bypass surgery for repeat revascularization, MI, but also survival, that it is somewhat astounding. And, and a lot of the data that we cited is not data that we went back and pulled out of the manuscripts ourselves. It was the actual supportive text provided in the, the document itself. So, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I can't speak for the process having not been there, but I think a more robust interaction would have been a lot more helpful. Thank you. You know, I'd, I'd like to direct this next question, you know, to Dr. Svensson. You know, Lars, I, you know, one of the, the things that people have been a little bit surprised about was that as surgeons, you know, we were not in favor of the radial artery graft as a, as a class of recommendation one. And, and, and you did a beautiful discussion, you know, explaining why. You know, those of us who were around in the 90s when um, radial artery grafting kind of had a resurgence, as you know, it had been done 20 years earlier, but was abandoned. Back in the 90s, we were seeing the same types of things happening, essentially using the radial artery in a situation where it was not going to work, you know, situations where there were competitive flow. Lars, what should the guidelines, what level of recommendation or class of recommendation should the guidelines committee have given for a, a radial artery? You know, and should they have put stipulations around it? Because we've learned an awful lot about when to use it. You know, I know, as you know, it's not, the problem is not the radial artery, but the problem is, is how it is used sometimes. What are your thoughts on that? Well, those are very good points, uh, Joe. I, I think the radial artery, in my opinion, shouldn't even have made it into the tables. And it out there should have been a discussion about when is it appropriate to use bilateral mammary arteries versus a radial artery. And as you pointed out, the, the area of concern is always a 50, 60% stenosis of the right coronary artery. And what do you use for that and the whole issue of competitive flow? And then uh, the other issue then is, do you take the right uh, internal mammary artery and use that for some other vessel on the left side? And so th the idea of making it a strong recommendation to have the priority of the radial artery, I think is concerning in a table. It is up, up to the surgeon in the end to use what works best in a individual site and which ar arteries are being bypassed. And certainly the ideal is I would argue bilateral mammary arteries with another arterial graft of some type, and that usually is the radial artery or jump grafts with the internal mammary arteries. And so I don't think it should even be in the tables and we need further understanding of the long-term results. And as you point out, we had a resurgence of radial arteries. We tried nifedipine and all sorts of medications and papaverine to try and keep those arteries open. But unfortunately, on late follow-up, we have seen many of them stone nose up at a rate equal to uh, vein grafts and sometimes worse. Thank you, Lars. You know, one of the questions and concerns we're getting from uh, you know, many of our attendees is that the cardiologists are now teaching these guidelines and um, they're implementing them. Maybe we could go around the panel and um, all of you could talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your own home institutions. And then what do you think we should do about it? Maybe we can start with Tom. Thanks, Joe. I think one of the 
big developments that have taken place over the last 10 years has been the creation of the heart team. And I think that we, uh, we on a weekly basis, uh, sit down and we discuss cases that come to the heart team to try to determine what's the best treatment for each of the patients. And I think, I think it is really important that we cardiac surgeons take a very proactive evidence-based approach to the decisions and certainly the discussions that are made for all these patients. And, and I think that, uh, that rather than just, you know, nodding an affirmation for the, for the decisions that are made by, by our cardiology colleagues, I think we have to more strongly advocate uh, for the evidence that, we, that we've talked about tonight. Thank you, Tom. Len, what are your thoughts on this? Well, we too have seen a, you know, a rapid escalation in, in the use of PCI for all sorts of indications. Um, and in a very competitive market like New York, uh, that sort of application or widespread application of that technology um, goes across the entire region. And it is my opinion that, as Tom mentioned, I think we have to just go at it with the data, but also we have to participate and make sure we're present in heart team discussions. It's always easy for us to, to find a reason to go back to the operating room and, and we'd all rather be there than almost anywhere else. But we have to participate in the discussions. We have to be present at CAF conferences. If there's an opportunity to educate them on the outcomes for modern coronary bypass grafting, I think that opportunity has to be taken. You know, for the, the FAME trial, again, a highly select group of surgeons to participate in a trial, the mortality was 0.3%. But if you look across a widespread community of coronary bypass grafting, for instance, in a, in a system like ours in New York State, where there's reporting at not only the institutional level, but individual surgeon level, the mortality in New York State, all comers, regardless of ejection fraction, age, reoperative status, was 1.1%. Was you were not an outlier, statistically speaking, if you had a mortality of zero. So it tells you that the, out, the outcomes published in CAS and the VA study, et cetera, are only gonna be better with bypass surgery than they were in the past. And with the improvement in long-term outcomes with multi-arterial grafting, irrespective of whether you believe it's a bilateral mammary or radio artery strategy, as long as you're doing multi-arterial grafting, you're helping the patients that much more. And that's the message we have to keep getting out as we compete against, oh, we got a new stent. We got a new stent, we got a new stent. Um, bilateral mammaries hold up quite well. Multi-arterial grafting is the way to go. And we have to keep pushing that. Thank you, Len. Lars, I think this is a, a really great question for you. As, as we all know, um, you're the chair of a heart and vascular institute where you oversee both cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, you're their leader. So what are you seeing at your institution and, and, and what can you do from your, your position, you know, to make sure that patients get the right therapy? Well, it's a good question, uh, Joe, and thank you. Um, so I pivot off what Tom and Len said that uh, the team approach is important and results are a lot better. We have seen in our own institution a continuing decline in coronary bypass deaths, and that includes with more complexity of operations being done, uh, not only as far as comorbidity, but also more arterial grafting. And I think as we saw with the early data with internal mammary artery, single internal mammary artery, that resulted in a decline in mortality versus uh, septus vein grafts. Now, with your specific question, and I have talked obviously to our cardiologists um, about their thoughts. And as you know, this is a very uh, collegial environment. So there isn't the same uh, competition over who does what. And so I cannot say I've seen a big change and it continues to be a discussion particularly about the patients with complex three vessel coronary artery disease. I think that looking at the European societies to just bring that up since it hasn't been discussed where the surgeons have worked closely with the cardiologists 
there the ejection fraction did not come into the guidelines as far as what was recommended for triple vessel coronary artery disease. And I think that's probably wise. And uh, when it comes to that whole issue, I think in future, we need to look at it from the point of being uh, somewhat uh, distant from the injection fraction. I, I was on the call with the uh, presidents of the cardiology societies and uh, Tom uh, um, and John and Shaf, you know perhaps, but John actually asked the society presidents, what would they like if they had triple vessel coronary artery disease? And every single one of them said, well, they wanted a coronary artery bypass operation. So when the situation is your own life, it somewhat changes the way you look at things. You know, I think that's an excellent point because sometimes it appears that the guidelines have become out of touch with clinical practice. And I think that's probably what frightens most of us because you know, usually the heart team, the surgeons, the, the interventionalists, we get together and we make the right decision for the patient. And as you just alluded to, I think we would all agree that in patients with triple vessel disease, um, the best treatment is coronary artery bypass surgery. And unfortunately, these guidelines did not you know, recognize that. Although this, que this question has been very popular with our attendees and it's not necessarily directed about the guidelines. But it brings up, I think, an important question, and, and, and maybe we can have each panelist maybe answer in about 30 to 60 seconds. Should we have coronary specialists? Dr. McGilvery? Well, you know, I think, Joe, that, um, that I, I think with the amount of coronary artery disease, it's the leading cause of death, not only in the country, but in the world. I mean, it, it's the predominant lesion that we as cardiac surgeons deal with in adult cardiac surgery. Uh, I, I personally don't think we should have coronary specialists in general, and that we should all be um, quite facile and adept at doing coronary surgery. All the more reason that we have to get these guidelines right. You know, we have to be able to speak with a single voice about what we recommend that all of us uh, do for our patients with coronary artery disease. Len? You know, the, the cabbage surgery is still one of the most common operations performed in the U.S., and I think it would be difficult for patient access if we were trying to restrict coronary bypass to, quote, specialists. That being said, though, I do think that multi-arterial grafting is complicated, and there is a learning curve, and I think it behooves all of us to get on that train and learn it so that you can do it locally. And as Tom said, it's going to be something that all of us need to do. I think the sooner we learn it and, and teach it to our trainees so that they too can carry this tradition on into the future, not only for our specialty, but most importantly for the patients and their improved survival. Lars? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. And as you know, there's quite a lot of debate going on about this. And certainly, Coronary artery bypass surgery is not the volume it used to be, and we peaked at 1,925. Now, that was mostly cabbage alone. Now, our numbers are about, as you know, about 1,600 cabbages a year, but only half of those now are cabbage alone. And so those are usually combination procedures with mitral valve, aortic valve, or aortas. And it, I think it would be bad for ultimate outcomes for patients if cardiac surgeons didn't know how to do coronary artery bypass surgery. However, I would agree with what Len and Tom were alluding to is that there is certainly benefit for complex coronary artery bypass surgery to be done with people who particularly have expertise in that. In one sense, also for the re-operations, that's where I think there's also benefit of having people who have done a lot of redos and have a lot of experience with coronary artery bypass surgery, because as you know all too well, you were a master at this. 
uh, dealing with these patients can be very difficult. And there's a lot of judgment that comes into those patients. It's not a simple matter of, first of all, where you put the grass. It's also a matter of what graft material you have and what your options are. So then it really starts getting complex. And then I think there is the benefit to having a cadre or specialist to manage those more complex coronary artery bypass patients. Well, thank you. Insightful, all three of you as always. Well, you know, in the remaining 10 minutes, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit. You know, our society's decided not to endorse these guidelines because we believe they are not in the best interest of our patients with ischemic heart disease. However, our societies do acknowledge that it is in the best interest of our patients for the cardiology and cardiothoracic surgical societies to work together, to develop guidelines that assist us in taking the best care of our patients with ischemic heart disease. So this is a question that has been asked by many of the attendees and I'd like to ask our panelists, how do we best move forward to develop guidelines that we all can support? And maybe Lars, we can start with you. Well, thank you, Joe. Yes, uh, we have had some very collegial uh, discussions with the AHA and ACC, and I have had uh, personal discussions with the presidents around this topic. And uh, we've made progress and um, we are continuing to talk uh, with them. Uh, John's had some discussions, uh, Schaff also has been involved. And uh, I have another discussion tomorrow uh, with the leadership of the cardiology groups. And look, many of us are members of those cardiology societies too. And ultimately this is about the recommendations that or, or what we believe is best for our patients. I mean, ultimately, that is our true north, or in Viking terms, our lodestone. Uh, it's about doing the best for our patients. And remember, there are a lot of people who look at these guidelines apart from us as physicians, patients do, and attorneys. And so we need to remember that this is a very broad audience. Uh, I have great faith uh, based on the discussions that we've been involved with, that uh, there will be progress on this matter. And it's not just about coronary artery disease guidelines. We are going to have to deal with TAVR guidelines, mitral valve, mitral valve clip guidelines. So we're having a much broader discussion than just coronary artery disease. And I, I believe we will make uh, progress because there is goodwill on both sides. And we have not as cardiothoracic surgeons entirely been uh, innocent in this. And basically, if you think about the radial artery, this is an internal uh, disagreement among uh, well-meaning and experts in coronary artery bypass surgery. And uh, that is a internal debate that we should address in our own discussion. So thanks for asking. Well, thank you, Lars, and I, and, I, and I speak for everyone. We appreciate your, you know, your leadership in this and working with the, the leadership of the uh, cardiology societies. But maybe I can ask Len and Tom, you know, if, if, if we think about a little bit about the process and, and a little bit the way guidelines happen today, what are some of the things that you would like to see to ensure that our society voices, you know, are heard? Len? It's my understanding that our European colleagues have evolved to the point where the surgeons have fair representation in these guideline writing committees. And to me, that's, that's where it has to go. And I know it's a process and, and couldn't be more appreciative of what Lars and, and John and Schaff have, have done on all of our behalfs to try to level the playing field so that we can have adequate representation and have a voice or a stronger voice in the process. I think without that, it's gonna be an uphill climb. And so we need to have, have the ability to, to stick together and, 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 and push forward with what we believe is best in the best interest of our patients. And I, I would vote for something along those lines. Thank you. Tom, we're gonna to give you the last word on this. Well, well thanks, Joe. And, uh, and I do really appreciate Lars and Len's comments. 
uh, and was, as was stated by both, this isn't about advocating for our specialty or for what we want as surgeons. Our role is to advocate for our patients. The process should be based on the best medical evidence. And I think it's important that we all collegially sit down and look at what the best medical evidence is. And, and not just cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, but I do think that it should also, these guideline writing committee committees should also include some primary care physicians and some internists who are also involved in the care of these patients. And, and, and the decisions should be made not by the committee, but basically by the data and having an appropriate process where there is fair, equal representation of experts. We're not experts just in cardiac surgery. We're, we're experts in coronary artery disease or valvular heart disease or aortic disease. And I think that having equal representation on these writing committees is the answer to that in the best interest of our patients. You know, thank you, Tom. And I want to thank all our panelists as well as our attendees but what a terrific discussion. Again, as, as Tom so beautifully said, this is all about the patient and doing the right thing. Well, for our closing comments this evening, I'm gonna ask Dr. Uh, Calhoun, president of the STS, to deliver a few closing remarks. I think I'll start with, wow, you guys did a great job. Uh, thanks everybody for attending tonight. On behalf of the panelists, the STS, AHS, Dr. Kashafshi and Sabic. I hope some of the explanation and clarification of our concerns have been useful. As to next steps, uh, Lars has outlined that uh, we're continuing to meet with the uh, ACC and AHA. The AHS and STS leaders working on this issue will meet again soon, I'm sure. We're hopeful for, for significant changes in the process of developing guidelines to allow us, as Tom said, to better serve and counsel our patients. Some people asked, are we considering the possibility of getting this out to other people? And we are, the possibility of maybe editorials or publications and medical or cardiology centric journals and forums to reach the right audience. Each of us remains really committed to working with our colleagues locally in heart teams, something that Schaff pointed out, to provide the best possible patient outcomes. The AHS and STS expect our respective cardiac societies would work nationally as a collaborative heart team, just like we strive for locally. It's this kind of collaborative effort with more equitable rep representation has been outlined, more careful consideration of data from trials, which weren't really designed to address some of our concerns that we seek. However, should our efforts fall short of the mark our patients deserve, we've even considered the possibility of doing guidelines ourselves. Uh, in, a, in a mechanism as outlined by the institution of, Institute of Medicine. I guess, again, I just thank everybody's attention and interest, encourage you to remain engaged, provide us feedback and insights you may have to help us better serve you and our patients. So uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you and good night. Thank you, Dr. Calhoun, and thank you to all our panelists today for your participation and insight. Make sure to save the date for the 2022 STS Coronary Conference, which will be held in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, June 3rd through the 5th. Add your name to the interest list and we'll let you know when abstract submission and registration open. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll enjoy a variety of discounts, benefits, and opportunities to help you grow professionally. Learn more at sts.org membership. The STS Leadership Institute is a year-long program that helps early and mid-career CT surgeons develop the course leadership skills that are imperative for success in the ever-changing healthcare environment. Applications for the 2022-2023 session are due March 1st. Learn more and apply at sts.org slash leadership institute. Save the date for two STS webinars coming next month. Learn more about both programs on the calendar of events on the STS website.